to do the first thing and to do like a clap in front of your face just so I can sync up the audio with the video. Just do that. Do that? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Ready? Ready. What's your name and what do you do? Uh, my name is Dick Griffith. I don't do anything. I'm retired. <laughs> We can improvise if we want on some of these, um, if we like. But uh, so these are ones that I wrote. Uh, what makes a good adventure in your mind? Something that's original. It has to be, preferably, something that no one else has done. And yeah, that's. So you've got a long list of those. Do you? Correct? Yep, I, I try to. I work very hard at it. <laughs> For you, was there like a, a genesis in your life, something that happened, somebody that inspired you? Um, of course, I started on the, on the rivers first, you know, the Western Rivers, the Green River, and the Colorado River. And, um, you know, you read stories about these people that go down the river. They're long trips. Uh, the Green River and the Colorado River it takes three months, almost three months to make that trip. And so it's, there's a lot goes into it. In those days, now you can't do it anymore because it's all dammed up. But back in the 40s and the 50, early, early 50s, you could do that. And, and so, um, so those were you like kind of your first trips? And then... They were my first trips, yep. Mm -hmm. And was there, what was the, uh, what, what, what did it like actually take to do those kind of expeditions in those days? Gear wasn't there and actually it didn't um, it didn't take that much all you had to do is get a surplus boat and a few oars and you could take off and of course it was a learning curve because I um, wrecked boats and um, lost boats and lost partners and you know things didn't always go smooth but you always come out one way or the other you start all over again and go again were there people in those days that you were drawing inspiration from or people that you had to get advice from? No, there was there was river runners, of course, you know, like um, Major Powell that did the trip first in 69, 1869, and a few others passed that. But uh, when I come along, I was probably the seventh to make the trip. And I was young, I was 21, 22 at the time, inexperienced. I just got my start being a boatman and a guide on the San Juan and Glen Canyon, and then I worked up from there. What kind of equipment would they use for guiding stuff in those days? It was just surplus 10-man rubber rafts. You buy them for 125 bucks in Salt Lake City at that time. Cheap boats. And then, so ju jumping ahead, then um, tell me, like, what, what brought you to Alaska? And then, yeah. I got out of school. I had a degree in geology, and I wasn't going no place, so I decided to come to Alaska, and I got to Alaska. Um, I didn't go any place either <laughs> with the degree. <laughs> and then how did... Uh, or what was your first, like, trip expedition in Alaska? In Alaska, uh, my first trip was from Kaktovik to Anaktuvik Pass. I think it took me 53 days and something like 450 miles. And, of course, in those days I didn't know how to, um, <clears throat> they didn't have packaged foods like you got now. And so I carried a rifle, and so I more or less killed my way across and what, what year was that? 1959. And so then, again, you know, in Alaska, was anybody doing that kind of stuff? Yeah. The Brooks Range was, nobody went to the Brooks Range. There was absolutely, I don't know of anybody that was up there in that time period. That's was kind of a blank spot, and that's what intrigued me. It was, it was blank. And, of course, years later, then I went from, 
Anik Tuvik to Kotzebue walked across the mountains and floated down the Noatak, but went all the way across eventually. So it's, I mean, it's fair to say that you've been adventuring in Alaska for more than half a century. Uh, easily, yes. Yeah. I mean, this is a pretty big, broad question, but what are, what, what are some of the changes that you've noticed in Alaska in the half century? Um, the villages, um, because I've, I worked in all the villages uh, building runways, you know, and I was there when, like Kaktovik uh, in 59, the people were healthy, they were happy, and now you go back to Kaktovik, any village up there, and they're obese, and half of them got, are diabetic, and the health they're just not healthy anymore. They don't get um, physical activity on a snow machine that they got with a dog team. So they de deteriorated. And so, you know, the focus of this film is kind of like trying to project out 50 years. Um, and the way I've been breaking these questions up in this, you know, with other, you know, interviews is um, kind of a, Worst case scenario, best case scenario. So if we project out from where we are now, 2015, 50 years into the future, what, what would be like your best case scenario for Alaska's <laughs> destiny? It's gonna, I don't know if it's the best case or not. I'd say it's more like the worst case. There's going to be a lot more people up here, that's for sure, because I have saw what happened in the last 50 years. This place is, um, you might say, Anchorage is crowded. I mean, um, if I had to do it all over again, I certainly wouldn't settle in Anchorage, but I'm stuck. So I got to stay here now because <laughs> that's where my family is. Yeah. And, and then, so what, what's your projection for the worst case? Or I, I guess that was the. Yeah, the, well, like I said, it's with this mild winters and nice summers. People are going to, it's going to be an attractive place. It's just bound to be attractive. People are going to move in. It's not like it was back in the 50s or 60s where it was, you know, we haven't had any 30 below zero weather ever since those days. It's lucky if it gets down to 10 below now. And so then, you know, there's... Uh then the, na the native culture component, and then what about the, um, the kind of the more American, you know, culture? How, ha how, how have you seen that shift, you know, in 50 years? Since? Well, of course, the, <clears throat> the native is, that's one of the problems. They've adopted white man's foods, which are not the best in the world. You know, I've, it's sad to say, but I've little kids, native kids that see them go to the grocery store in the morning for breakfast and they get a bottle of pop and a bag of potato chips and that's their breakfast. And that's kind of sad because uh, the, uh, our food is, is, is no good. It's absolutely no good. It's ruining the people. You, you notice that when you're on expeditions going through villages that it's hard to like get good food for yourself to be supplied? Oh, I can get good food because um, I buy it in the village store, but I buy the right food. I don't buy the junk food. I don't buy soda pop and um, potato chips, that's for sure. And, and so, you know, this, this uh, film is about the expedition that Hig and Aaron did around Cook Inlet with their two kids. Um, what are your thoughts on that kind of thing? You know? Well, to me, it's, um, you know, a trip like they did is just, it's unbelievable to me because they had two kids with them, you know, and anybody that's ever raised two kids knows that um, they're going to be whining and they're going to be uh, bored and um, God knows what's going to happen to them. But <laughs> just, I, I just can't imagine it working. To me, it's, it's, it's just inconceivable to take two kids. <laughs> it's bad enough just taking a partner with you, not alone two kids. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's going in the film. <laughs> um, and, 
And and so um, you know, I feel like we kind of you know t touched on this, but you know there was the slideshow of yours that I saw a long time ago, where you know you 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 know between expeditions had seen the kind of the difference between communities, um, you know, from a kind of a traditional more or more traditional kind of subsistence culture to a white man culture. Um, do you th think that I mean? Is it is it too late? Do you think for people to go back to that kind of like cultural identity, or you know, what's the hope for? They'll they'll never go back. It's too hard to go back. Um, I just can't see them going back. Um, you know, these these people in order to go to the grocery store, they hop on a on a snow machine, and um, I, I can't see them going back to subsistence, totally subsistence. They partially, you know, they still go out and get whales and they kill caribou and they, they do that part yet, but it's so easy. You know, it's like the Anaktuvik people with a snow machine. They can go out and one hunt and they can bring back a, a year's supply of, of, of caribou. And it used to be when they had dog teams, they had each family had to kill 90 caribou. That's a lot of caribou. Now they just need a few. Snow machines don't eat caribou, fortunately. So it's all changed the culture has. It's just, it's not there anymore. They like to believe it is, but it's not. And then, <clears throat> what do, you, do you have any um, concerns or opinions on kind of uh, Alaska's um, kind of economic and or like uh, development strategy currently? That's a tough one because, um, you know, this is a resource state. And what people you got here, like in Anchorage, they're not going to survive unless they got resources, you know. So we're going to heavily depend on oil. There's no doubt about it. We're an oil economy. It's here to stay. And then what about, uh, you know, like the more sustainable things like uh, salmon or other fisheries? Salmon and fisheries, they're your mainstay. There's no doubt about that. Um, <clears throat> the salmon, um, that's the bread and butter, you might say, of the villages anyway. Without them, they won't survive, and hopefully we will always have salmon. Do you, do you have any concerns, like for the king salmon, or you know the ones that are? Well, yeah, king salmon, you know, it, it's the fishery is is, you know, it's like I can remember fifty years ago, we could go out and you catch kings, you know, anywhere. The king salmon are now a king salmon is rare. You can't get kings no more, which is unfortunate because I love to eat them. There are no kings, so I I hope it survives, but I don't know. Yeah. And, you know, so you know the, the you know the issue has come up several times. You know, in talking to people about you know climate change, but you know from your perspective just an on the ground visual do, do you feel like you know there's a, is there still a debate about climate change or I don't think there's any debate at all you can see it coming I mean it's here I mean we're already living in it anybody who's lived up here very long can see what's happened up here we got warmer winters and nice summers I mean um, there's just no comparison it's here. I mean, there's the glaciers are going to melt and um, sea levels will probably rise. Um, it's just inevitable. What do, do you see anything like particularly like alarming about that, or is it just kind of? I think we're going to have to live with it. We're going to have to get used to it. I don't. Uh, you're not going to turn it back. There's no way. It just um, whatever the cause, maybe it's accelerated now, but um, you're going to have to live with it because it's not going to go back. This happened in Alaska, you know, over and over. Uh, there was a land bridge between um, Alaska and 
in Siberia, you know, that's that's underwater now. So it's it goes back and forth. Like I said, there's woolly mammoth on Wrangell Island three and a half thousand years ago, and there had to be something supporting them. It wasn't snowflakes. experience or projecting onto others, do you think there's a value in doing long expeditions and like is there something we can, you know, learn about? <laughs> if there's no value at all. <laughs> Absolutely none. Only only value is is to the person that's doing them. Huh? I can't see any value to them. I mean, my my going across all across Alaska and skiing all over the place. Um no value. Across Canada, no value. The only thing I proved is you don't need a rifle for polar bears. That's about the only thing I proved. <laughs> you don't need any protection because they're pretty mellow. Um, but, you know, you have a great sense of geography. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's about it, but it it's personal. <laughs> yeah. component, you know, doing ground truth trekking, you know, is what they're, you know, so like learning about the natural resources and, you know, how people live and interact with the environment. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's okay, so the, the last one that I've been, you know, asking everybody in this long-term, you know, question, you know, 50 years out, do you have any advice or Dick Griffithisms? For people hoping to shape the future. In a <laughs> if you live on the sea coast, I'd move away. <laughs> you, you better get used to it. It's coming. Yeah. All right. Awesome. We, we nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> Got anything else? Nope. I don't have nothing else. <laughs> All right.